So here we are today. We are going hard core into inverses. What are inverse functions and why do we need them? Well, we need them because they undo each other. That's the important thing. We need them because, maybe less because, their domains and ranges switch in the most interesting way. For instance, you remember this because we did this problem. Um, suppose there's a function f of x. Example. Suppose there's a function f of x, and what it is is the set of three points. Three non-continuous points, just the separate points. So how about 6, 9, and 4, 3, and negative 2, I don't know, 8. I just made those up. If f of x consists of those three points, then f inverse of x consists of these points. 9, 6, 3, 4, and 8, negative 2. That's one very cool thing about, about um, inverses, and we're going to find more. Um, as you know, all of the first coordinates are x coordinates. They make up the domain of f of x. All the second coordinates are y coordinates and they make up the range of f of x. But now the numbers that were in the domain of f of x are in the range of f inverse of x. And the numbers that were in the range of f of x are in the domain of f inverse of x. That is just so cool, it blows my mind. However, <clears throat> before we get into that, we need to get into one-to-one. -one. And we talked yesterday about one-to-one, -one, and I said we're going to talk again about one-to-one -one functions. Well, I'm going to use the horizontal line test on these functions. I'm going to graph these functions. I think there are only three. I'm going to graph them. And then, let's see, one divided by eight x minus one. There we go, I went to y equals, and here in y1, I've got 1 8 x minus 1, which is what this is. Now I'm going to graph it. We're being asked, is this 1 to 1? Well, yes. It is. This is a straight line and it's slanted. Rising from left to right. And if I draw a horizontal line through it, that horizontal line 
intersects the graph at only one point. Forget these little straight things. Uh, what this line looks like is this. I draw a horizontal line through it. That horizontal line touches the graph at only one point. Therefore, this is a one-to-one -one function. One-to-one -one function. Let's see. Because. The graph passes the horizontal line test, the HLT. That's all they're asking you to do here. Yes, F of X is one to one. Now we're going to go to something that you may have never seen before. This is an exponential function. And let me write this a little better. This is F of X equals 2.8 raised to the X power. That's what an exponential function is. And here's its graph. Now, even though it looks like the line is flat down there, it's not. It's getting closer and closer and closer to the X axis until it's almost impossible or it's impossible to show that the line of the graph is separate from the x-axis. You just can't show it, but it is. It's getting closer and closer and closer to the x-axis. In fact, even though this is not a fraction, a rational function, the x-axis in this graph is its horizontal asymptote. So this is a non-fraction graph that has a horizontal asymptote. We're going to be working more with exponential functions in the last week of class. But right now we're asking, is this one-to-one? -one? Yes. Down here you'll have to take my word for it. But yes, this is a one-to-one -one function, and therefore it has an inverse. We're going to have lots of fun with its inverse. And what about this? Is this a one-to-one -one function? No, it flunks the horizontal line test. That horizontal line touches the graph at more than one point, at two points to be exact. So no, this is not one-to-one. -one. On the other hand, the reason this is one-to-one -one is that the horizontal line crosses the graph at only one point. And up here, the horizontal line crosses the graph at only one point. That's what a one-to-one -one function is. Now we care because we can't find an inverse if the function is not one to one. So first we check and see if this function is one to one and let's graph it. Turn on, graph, clear, 3x plus 4, up uh, minus 4. 3x minus 4. Graph. Yes, imagine drawing a red line or a horizontal line 
through any part of that graph and that horizontal line will touch the graph at only one point. So yes, this is one to one. Therefore, it has an inverse. We're going, going to go through the steps to finding an inverse. We've done this before. We did it before the test and we did it yesterday and we're going to do it today and we're going to do it over and over and over again. There are definite steps to follow and if you follow them, you'll get it right. So here we go. Step one. Change the f of x to y. y equals 3x minus 4. 2. Let's go back to the first problem. Well, my example problem. When, you're, when you've got an inverse, you switch the x's and y's. Therefore, that's what step two is. I'm going to switch the x's and y's. x equals 3y minus 4. Now to find the formula for the inverse, find a formula for the inverse. I am going to solve for y. Okay, so let's solve for y now so we can get y equals. That's step three, solve for y. I'll, I'll add four to both sides of this equation because to solve for y, I have to isolate y. So I'll add four and add four. Therefore, x plus four equals 3y. So let me erase that up here so that I can keep this kind of pure. Didn't think about that. Very good, now I'm going to solve for y. All right, so y equals x plus 4 over 3, which is the same thing as, if you remember, you've got a 1, an invisible 1, in front of the x. This is 1 third x plus four thirds. So the formula for the inverse function, and you don't, you almost never have to write that. In fact, I can't think of you having to write it anywhere. Um, the answer box is what you would write that in. One third x plus four thirds. And so there is your inverse function. Now later on, we're going to be graphing both of these on the same axes. So I want to do it now, just so you'll be prepared. I'm going to come down to Y2 parentheses, one divided by three, parentheses closed, times x, plus parentheses four divided by three, parentheses closed. That's there, that's what I typed. One third x plus four thirds. Now I'm going to graph both of these. So this first line is f of x 
The second line is the inverse. One third X plus four thirds. Now let me show you something else. This makes me wish I still had the color. The um, the color um, uh, grapher. But I don't, so we we make do. I'm going to graph another line in Y3. I'm going to graph the line Y equals X, and I want you to see what happens. Okay, that's Y equals X. Comes right up the middle. This is Y equals X. And look how the point where the inverse functions, they're inverses of each other, the point where the inverse functions cross is on the line y equals x. It would have to be because we built the inverse function by reversing x and y. Another way to say this is that these two lines are mirror images of each other across the line y equals x. So, I'm thinking this. I'm going to graph these and make them different colors. Kind of move it over here a little bit. Or up. Yeah, up. All right, make it a little smaller. There. Okay, this is f of x. Ooh, I'll do that. This is f of x. This is f inverse of x. And this is the line y equals x. See how it works. Okay. We're going to determine if this function is one to one. And if it is, we're going to find its inverse. Well, let's take a look. Let's clear all this stuff. I'm going down Y1, Y2, Y3 and hitting clear every time and now I'm going back to Y1. All right, X to the third minus two. X caret three. Now I have to hit the right arrow key to come down. Minus two. Graph. Yes, it is. This looks flat, but it's really not. It's it's almost flat. But it is just a little bit slanted in real life. The calculator just can't make it fine enough. Anyway, 
this does pass the horizontal line test. So it is one to one. Therefore, I can go through those steps and find the inverse. Incidentally, this should have been step five. So step one, change f of x to y. y equals x to the third minus two. Step two, switch your X and Y. Step three, do whatever it takes to solve for Y. I'm gonna roll this up, scroll it up. If I add two to both sides, that will get Y to the third by itself. So x plus 2 equals y to the third. I've almost solved for y, but not quite. I need to get y equals, not y to the third equals. So I'm going to take the cube root of both sides of this equation. Cube root. Why would I do that? Because the cube root of y to the third equals y to the three over three, which is one, so this is y. That's what I want. So y equals the cube root of x plus two, and what that means is F inverse of X equals the cube root of X plus two. And we'll put our blue box around. So that's what you put in the answer box, the cube root of X plus two. If you've got any questions, let me know. Aha. Cube root, we've got one of those on the calculator. Let me clear this and show you how to get to the cube root. Click on the math button. The cube root is right down here at number four. Enter. Now I'm going to type 5x underneath the radical, the root sign. and then hit the right arrow key to come to the outside. This is the cube root of five to the X. I'm gonna graph it. Graph it. Yes, this passes the horizontal line test. You can imagine that or I can put a grid in there somehow. I forget how. Do I want a grid? It would be nice, wouldn't it? I forget how to do it though. So, I, oh, oh, format graph. No, I'm not gonna bother with that now. For now, we'll just do it that way. So yes, it's one-to-one. -one. 
I'm just all over the place with colors, aren't I? All right, now, ooh, this looks ugly. Can we do this? Of course we can. Step one, y equals the cube root of 5x. Step two, switch the x and the y. Step three, solve for y. To undo a cube root, I have to cube. So I have to cube both sides. Why does that undo it? Here's why. You've got 5y in a cube root, and you're cubing it. Well, that's 5y to the 3 over 3 power. That 3 is the numerator. This 3 is the denominator. The 3's cancel, leaving you with a 1 equals. 5y to the 1 power, and that equals 5y. Ta-da! So, x to the third equals 5y. Solve for y. Divide by 5, divide by 5. So, we have accomplished step four. X to the third over five, which is the same thing as one fifth, X to the third, equals Y. And so step five, let's move it over here so it's more visible. F inverse, of x equals let's just say x to the third over five they're equally correct that and that but you tell me what my math lab wants if they don't like this, just do that. But there we go. Here's our inverse of this. Yep. Yep, 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 okay. Now, how do you prove? We're gonna go over that too. Everyone has to suffer through this. So get ready. Um, there's a way to prove that two functions are or are not inverses of each other. And I'm going to show you. Okay, here's the rule. If two functions are inverses of each other, then stop that. I don't want it in blue. F circle F inverse of X equals X. And it's not enough just to do it that way. You have to do it the other way too. F inverse circle F 
of x has to also equal x. So we're go going to have to take the composition of functions here. So to take f of f inverse of x, then here's what I have to do. That'll be f of f inverse of x. So here we go f of x equals 8 ninths times x. So f of f inverse, whatever you put in the parentheses, has to go in the x. So that will be 8 ninths times f inverse of x which is going to be 8 ninths. Now I'm going to write what F inverse is. 9 eighths X. Well, that's 8 over 9 times 9 over 8 times X. The 9's cancel, the 8's cancel. And you're left with 1. 1x, which is x. So this way worked. We still have to go the other way though. F inverse, circle F. Of F, uh, of x is f inverse of f of x. Well, f inverse of x, the regular f inverse of x, up here is 9 eighths x. So f inverse of f of x is just going to put f of x in for the x. Well, this will be 9 over 8 times f of x, which is 8 ninths times x. I guess I should put it in there first. 8 ninths times x, which is 9 over 8 times 8 over 9 times x. The 8's cancel, the 9's cancel, leaving me with 1x, which is x. So yes, I have proved, proven, whatever, that they are, that f of x and f inverse of x really are inverses of each other. I, uh, when I was learning this, I asked my professor, wouldn't it be enough if I just take your word for it? I'll, I leave it to your imagination what he said. But the translation was no. I believe he may have said the F word in there. Yes, I was in college in the 80s, and that wasn't that long after the 60s when everybody said the F word all the time. So I bet your granny and grandpa said the F word, even if they act respectable now. I love the F word, but don't say it here. Okay, here we go. We're going to prove that these two guys are or are not 
inverses of each other. First, I take the composition one way, then I take the composition the other way. So F of F inverse of X is going to be F of F inverse of X. And that's going to equal, well, we need F of X, F of X equals 7 eighths X plus one. Hmm. Suspicious looking, isn't it? All right, so then F of X is going to be 7 eighths times F inverse of X plus one. Well, which is seven eighths times F inverse eight X minus eight over seven plus one. Yeah, that's true. Yep. All right. Equals. Let's factor the GCF out of there. That's going to be 7 over 8. Times 8 times X minus 1. Over. 7 plus 1 which will be, hmm, look at this, eights multiplied by X minus one. So the eights can cancel, the sevens can cancel, and I'm left with X minus one plus one, which is X. What do you know? I thought that one would mess everything up. So that works. Let's go the other way. F inverse, circle F of X equals F inverse of F of X. Well, F inverse of X equals 8x minus 8 over 7. So then, f inverse of f of x is going to equal 8 times f of x minus 8 over 7. So that will be 8 times Seven eighths X plus one minus eight over seven. Now we are going to need to distribute the eight into the parentheses. So that will be eight times seven eighths, let's say eight over one, times X plus eight, that's what that is, minus eight over seven. All right, the eights cancel. That's going to leave me with 7x plus 8 minus 8 over 7. 8 minus 8 is 0. 
So I'll have 7x over 7. Nah. And the 7's cancel. And I'm left with x. What do you know? So these guys really, really are inverses of each other. I really thought the answer would be no. I really thought that one would kill it. But no, they are inverses of each other. You do know you can just shout out if you've got a question. Well, now we're going to work on something tricky. And I really didn't think we would meet it in this course. We talked about it yesterday, and I said I didn't think you would encounter it. But guess what? You're going to encounter it. I should never say things like that. Oh, you'd never encounter anything in this course that's scary. Of course you will. All right, now, here we have, for the first time, a domain being specified. f of x equals the square root of x minus 3, going, starting at 3 and going to the right. Well, that is the domain of the square root of x minus 3. Remember how to find the domain of a square root. You pull out the radicand and set it greater than or equal to 0. Add 3 to both sides. You treat it just like an equation most of the time. equal to not zero. Zero plus three is three. Okay, so X has got to be equal to or greater than three. That's the domain of this function. We're going to be finding the inverse and they're telling you this is one to one. And it is. Now this is the domain of f of x, so I'm going to write that. If I'm going to find the inverse of f of x, then this is going to be the range of f inverse of x. Because remember, they switch. So this is also going to be the range of f inverse of x. That means the range of f inverse of x is going to be y greater than or equal to 3. Just an interesting aside that we may or may not have to use. Okay, now let's use our steps y equals the square root of x minus 3. 2. I'm going to have to square both sides. Oh, no, I'm not. Not yet. I'm going to reverse. The x and y. Then, to get y out from under the radical and the minus 3 while I'm at it, I'm going to have to square both sides. So I'll square x and I'll square the square root of y minus 3. And I'll have x squared 
equals y minus 3. Remember, squaring a square root liberates the radicand. Now all I have to do is add 3 to both sides. And that'll give me x plus ah, x squared plus 3 equals y. Oh, that's step 4. Step 5. F inverse of x equals x squared plus 3, which is not 1 to 1, but, but, just wait. We already know that the range is going to be three to infinity. That's in the y direction. Starts at three on the y axis and goes up forever. But what's the domain? We need to go up here. The domain up here is the range down here, but the range up here is going to be the domain down here. Let's find out what the range of x minus 3, the square root of x minus 3 is. Okay, the square root of x minus uh, 3, yeah. There I've got the square root of x minus 3. That's what we're dealing with. I'm going to graph it, and we're going to see what the range is. All right. Starts here on the y-axis, just like the regular, thank you, y equals the square root of x starts on the y-axis at 0, 0. But this is the square root of x minus 3. So it starts over here instead of over here, but it still starts down on the x-axis, which is where y equals zero. So the range up here, the range of f of x is starting at y equals zero and going slowly up to infinity forever. And that makes this the domain of f inverse of x. So the domain down here is 0 to infinity. But that's what the x's are doing. If I graph x squared plus 3, x squared plus 3 graph. What we're talking about, if the domain is from 0 to infinity, 
Let me change the window so you can see that. It means X min is zero. X max can go forever to infinity, so 10 is good enough. The range is going to be 3 to infinity, so y min is going to be 3, and y max is going to be infinity, so we'll settle for 10. Now this means that we are not showing the x-axis. So for you to be able to see that this starts at three on the y-axis and goes up forever and starts at uh, uh, y equals, well, x equals zero and goes to the right forever, I really need to put the rest of the, I mean, I need to go down to where you can see the the uh, uh, x axis. And that's going to be y equals zero. That's what the x axis is. So that you can see the x axis itself, I'm going to go down to negative one. That's the only reason. Because I want you to see the x axis. The domain up here was three to infinity. The range here is 3 to infinity. The range here is 0 to infinity. The domain here is x equals 0 going slowly to the right forever because it's going up in a hurry, but it's going, it is tilting out to the right so it's going to the right forever. So if we use only this part of x squared plus three, we do have a one-to-one -one function. And that's how the tricky stuff works. So much for wanting to avoid it. Let's see what else there is. For the one-to-one -one function, f of x equals one-fourth x to the third minus five, find the inverse, give the domain and range of f and f inverse. Okay. And then graph them both on the same set of axes. You can do that. And we'll do it with a graphing calculator. So let me get rid of these. Ah, there's only one. Okay. So let's go ahead and graph this. Um, I'm going to go uh, zoom six to set my window back to normal. Um, and now I'm going to do this one divided by four in parentheses, x caret three, hit the right arrow key to come down, minus five, and graph. Yes, it is one to one, and um, that's it. I mean, the domain of this, it's going to go to the left forever and the right forever. So the domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. The range is negative infinity to positive infinity because it goes down forever and up forever. So let's write that down now. Domain. negative infinity all the way to the left to positive infinity all the way to the right. The range goes from negative infinity all the way down 
to positive infinity all the way up. So I guess that would be D and U down and up. Well, now we're going to find the inverse. F inverse of X. No, Barbara. F of X is one, is one fourth X to the third minus five. So step one then is gonna be Y equals one fourth X to the third minus five. Step two, we switch the X and the Y. That's not X, that's Y. There, okay. Now, step three. Do whatever you need to do to solve for y. Sometimes it's real short, sometimes it's not real short. So here's x equals 1 fourth y to the third minus 5. We'll add with another color. Haven't done that today yet. I mean, I haven't used another color. All right, these guys cancel out or zero out. X plus five equals one fourth. Let me move that over. Equals one fourth Y to the third. Now, this one fourth is not being raised to the third power, otherwise it would be in parentheses with y. So this is an entirely separate little guy that's multiplying y to the third. So I can multiply him out. Multiply by four, in this case four over one, and multiply these guys by four. Over here, the fours cancel. They do cancel. So I'll be left with one times y to the third, which is just y to the third. But over here, I'm going to have four x plus 20. Now I have y to the third equals four x plus 20. I need y, nobody cares what y to the third equals. So I'll undo it by using the cube root, which means I have to take the cube root over here. And the cube root of y to the third is y to the three over three, which is y to the one, which is just y. So step four is going to be the cube root of four X plus 20 equals Y. So step five is F inverse of X equals the cube root of four X plus 20 or it would probably be okay to do this, the cube root of four times X plus five. Don't be tempted to take the square root of four because it's a cube root. 
there is no exact cube root of four. Now we're going to graph both of them. Well, okay, all right. We're going to have the cube root, so math and four. There we go, four X plus 20. Let me see if there was anything more there. Like, should I have added anything onto it or? No, mm -mm. no, okay. So there I have Y1 equals 1 fourth X to the third minus five, that's F of X. And Y2 is F inverse of X. Okay, let's graph it, see what they look like. Mm -hmm. All right, now I am going to come down to Y3. You don't have to do this unless you're told to, but I just want you to see how if I did this correctly, they're all going to they're both going to cross. F and F inverse are going to cross. Yeah. On the line Y equals X. I just think that's so cool. OK, enough of admiring my work. Now, finally, is this a finally? Yes, it is. Very last problem. Find F of F inverse of negative 2 where f of x equals this. Okay. Well, let's find f inverse and work on it. f inverse, well, no, we don't do that yet. f of x equals x to the seventh minus two. Y equals X to the seventh minus two. Two, X equals Y to the seventh minus two. Three, solve for Y. X equals Y to the seventh minus two. Add two to both sides because we're solving for Y. X plus two equals Y to the seventh. So to solve for Y, I take the seventh root of y, which gives me y to the seven over seven, which is y, or y to the one, which gives me y. Meanwhile, I have to do it over here too. The seventh root, there. So y equals the seventh root of X plus two. So F inverse of X equals the seventh root of X plus two. Now that's not what we're being asked because what we're being asked is this to find F of F inverse of negative two. 
Well, you can do that in your head. F inverse of negative two equals the seventh root of negative two plus two, which is the seventh root of zero, which is zero. Yeah, it's zero. So, um, I know that here, the point negative two, zero, is on the graph of F inverse of X. The reverse of that is going to be on the graph up here of F of X. So what we're finding is F of zero. And that will be negative two. which means that the point zero negative two is on the graph of f of x. See how it works? The points of f of x and f inverse of x are, are reversed. The x's and y's are reversed. 